Welcome everybody to YWCA Utah's 2021 Legislative Recap. My name is Gabriella Archuleta. I am the public policy MC for today's event. Thank you for joining us today. The program will last until 1 p.m. It is being recorded and we will make it available on our YouTube and Facebook pages. The purpose of today's event is to further our mission to eliminate racism and empower women through issue education. Our objective with this panel discussion is to explore specific legislation pertinent to YWC Utah's 2021 policy priorities in the areas of health and safety, racial justice and civil rights, and empowerment and economic advancement for women and girls. This recap is not meant to be a deep dive. We tracked over 100 bills during the session and it would be impossible to go into all of them. Our updated bill tracker is available on our website at ywcautahorg forward slash advocacy. We will accomplish our objective by highlighting specific bills that we supported that were sponsored by our six panelists who are senators and representatives of the Utah State Legislature. The panelists all sponsored legislation that spans all of our priority areas, but for today's discussion, they will speak to specific policy areas. Senator Escamilla and Representative Snow will discuss bills related to health and safety for women and girls. Senator Iwamoto and Representative Hollins will discuss bills related to racial justice and civil rights for women and girls of color. Representative Judkins and Representative Matthews will discuss bills related to empowerment and economic advancement for women and girls. The format is webinar style, audience members will stay muted, videos will stay off, and the chat is disabled. However, we encourage you to participate using Zoom reactions that are at the bottom of your screen. As you hear from our speakers today, feel free to use the hearts, applause, thumbs up, or any of the other reactions. You will find the reaction option at the bottom of your Zoom screen slightly to the right. It's a smiley face with a plus sign. And I wanna take a moment to share with you our 2021 policy priority areas. Okay, so these are our 2021 policy priority areas. Last fall, we surveyed our members, allies, and policy stakeholders and asked which issues were most important to them. Our public policy committee undertook a comprehensive assessment that resulted in these policy priority areas. I would like to get your input using the annotations feature at the top of your screen. You should see an options button at the very top. Click on the options button and you can select a stamp and you can select a heart, a star, an arrow, a check mark. So select a stamp and place your stamp on the policy priority that is most important to you. You'll notice at the bottom we have our message that we are doing our advocacy work with an anti-racist policy lens. So if that is what you are um, all about, then select that. And I'll go ahead and show you. There we go, we got a heart going on. Yeah, I'll just wait a minute while everybody uses their stamps. As you can see, we had really wide ranging policy priority areas and, um, and they were all covered at Utah's legislative section. Thank you all for um, sharing the issues that are important to you. Now I intro will introduce you to our new Chief Mission Impact Officer at YWCA Utah, Sandra Stokes, who will share with us the race, um, equity work happening at YWCA Utah and how we are using racial equity lens in our public policy work. 
Sandra Stokes has had, um, sorry about that. I just lost my page here. Sandra Stokes has, has worked within the nonprofit sector for over 20 years. Her passion for equity, social justice, and inclusion is present in all that she does. As a seasoned facilitator, she is at her best when working with groups and organizations to increase their understanding of intersectionality and social issues. Her work is rooted in helping people understand how implicit bias and microaggressions impact people's daily lives and manifest within the workplace. Sandra's goal is to help others learn how they can shift their own understanding to help advance equity. Sandra received her bachelor's in social work at the University of Utah and is in the process of acquiring a master's in public administration with an emphasis on executive leadership from the University of Utah. A few of her hobbies include camping, hiking, listening to music and exploring new artists. She loves hip hop, neo soul, indie trap, house, jazz and oldies. Sandra, the time is yours. Thanks Gabe. Good afternoon everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I just wanna take a quick moment just to say thank you to, all, to our senators and representatives um, for joining us today as well and to our policy team for helping with those broad uh, advocacy areas that we were focusing on and tracking all the bills and for the hard work that you've put into today as well. I'm very excited to be here at the YWCA and to start to work on campus and in community with the folks here. Um, we are tackling the conversations around race equity. And part of that is because here at the YWCA, we know our mission is dedicated to eliminating racism, empowering women, and promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. And for us um, right now, that can't be done without talking about racial and gender equity and looking at how as an organization, as a community here at the YWCA, what does racial equity look like um, in our programs, on our campus, in our services, and in community with one another? And part of that eliminating racism portion of our mission needs to be brought to life. And by bringing it to life, we are engaging in conversations around race equity, talking about what does race equity look like on a structural level, on a level, and more importantly, how is it manifesting itself um, and impacting the services that we provide. So I'm really excited to be in this work and in community with you all, but also here at the YWCA, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to take the time to focus on race equity. It's not just a one-time workshop and it is not just a um, opportunity to just talk about diversity, equity, belonging and inclusion, it's a process. And I am very grateful and proud of the way that our organization is engaging in tough conversations and trying to advance and break down on um, the ways that stru structural racism shows up, the way that white supremacy impacts um, the work that we're trying to do so we can have a stronger, more equitable approach um, to doing community building, but more importantly, providing services. With our policy work this year and creating a racial policy analysis lens, we, did, we kind of looked at what was going on um, structurally and on a local level, on a federal level, and as a society as a whole. And as we talked about what does it mean and why do we need a uh, racial and equity policy lens, part of it was looking at how do we intentionally look at policies that could um, strongly impact our communities, um, whether it be negatively or positively. We had to use that lens to look at what pieces of proposed legislation either further burdened members of our uh, BIPOC communities and what type of legislation would start to get to the root problems um, of structural racism or um, the way that gender inequities were showing up. So using that lens, whenever we were reading through a policy or a piece of legislation really informed our ability to try to bring that eliminating racism portion of our mission to life. So. I was really proud of the opportunity to bring the racial analysis lens together. Uh, my work was informed by the Race Policy, our uh, Race Matters Institute, and also looking at the way that other organizations um, have been showing up in community and just pushing the envelope a little bit further, but getting really intentional about looking at legislation that advanced racial equity. So I just want to commend um, our policy team again for taking that tool on to really look at 
how do we get some important legislative um, advancement and advocacy efforts that are targeting um, and dismantling the way that structural racism is impacting our state. So I look forward to uh, using the analysis again for the next session, but more importantly, um, I look forward to learning more about how we as individuals can continue to, in our own personal practice, dismantle and unlearn um, a lot of the structural racism that's ingrained in us. Um, so thank you for joining us again today. And I look forward to sharing more with you all as we bring our work uh, more to life um, in the community and on the campus. So thanks, Gabe. Thank you, Sandra. Your work and leadership are a true inspiration. And we are so fortunate to have you with us at the YWCA Utah. I'm really lucky because you are my supervisor, so I'm in good hands. <laughs> now we will talk about our policy priority area, health and safety for women and girls. Before we hear from our panelists in this section, who are Senator Escamilla and Representative Snow, I will share some highlights about federal and local legislation that have been happening. Federally, the House recently passed the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, which lapsed in 2019. And they also passed the VOCA fix, which is critical because it prevents future cut, cuts to um, crucial victim service grants. They are both going to the Senate now. At the Utah Legislative Session, Representative Johnson sponsored the Domestic Violence Essential Services Funds and was able to secure $1.7 million in one-time TANF funding that will go toward 14 domestic violence service providers across the state. Representative Romero sponsored the Sexual Assault and Intimate Partner Violence Prevention Education Appropriation Request and garnered nearly $3.6 million in one-time TANF funding. And this was a collaborative effort with about 19 organizations across the state of Utah. Utah's legislature passed several bills pertaining to women's health, domestic violence and sexual assault and reproductive health. Our first panelist to highlight some of the bills is Senator Luz Escamilla. On November 4th, 2008, Senator Escamilla was elected to the Utah State Senate to represent Senate District 1, becoming the first Latina elected in the Utah State Senate and the first immigrant elected in the Utah State Legislature. She serves in Senate leadership as the Senate Minority Whip. In 2005, Senator Escamilla was appointed by Governor John Huntsman as the first director for the State Office of Ethnic Affairs. For 14 years, she worked at Zions Bank. She is now Chief Operations Officer and partner at MeCare Network, a Utah-based healthcare startup focused on innovative solutions to care management. Senator Escamilla holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Marketing and a Master's degree in Public Administration from the University of Utah. She lives in the west side of Salt Lake City with her husband, Juan Carlos, and their children. Senator Escamilla, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Gabriela. It's always a pleasure to join the YWCA community, and uh, thanks for this invitation. Absolutely. Well, here's my first question to you. <clears throat> At YWCA Utah, we approach our advocacy and policy work by centering those in our communities who are most affected, impacted, or burdened by any proposed legislation. Communities of color continue to be disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. SB 158 Children's Health Coverage Amendment sought to provide health insurance for all Utah children. Will you talk about the strategies you use to advance equity in policies like SB 28 or SB 158? Um, absolutely, and thank you for this opportunity. I want to say that what um, as we continue to become more proactive on our approaches on addressing the intersectionality between um, race and gender and socioeconomic status and all those cultural identities that really um, make a person a person and not they're not separate but they are you know there's intersectionality between them our legislation is the same right when you move forward policy um, you need to think of all the communities that are not at the table that may be on the sides trying to create their own mechanisms to come to the table and that takes time so i I try to focus my legislation always thinking on the lens of everyone that's not able to have that opportunity to be at the Capitol and have someone to represent their voices. Um, they may not have lobbying lobbyists, you know, uh, moving forward some of their their interest or stakeholders that have opportunities to bring their ideas to the table. So I SB 158 it was one of them, right? You will think um, our economy certainly has gone through a interesting process with you know, surviving a one year of a pandemic, there's still more to come. 
but we did have a, a serious amounts of money in, in, you know, coming to the state of Utah via relief funds from the federal government. So we saw a, a really odd budget uh, process that we never seen before really in the legislature with the amount of, of federal funds that were injected to our economy. That created an interesting dilemma. And that is we had a lot of one-time money and you know, certainly even TANF saw some of those one-time monies coming in but not ongoing, right? So that was the number one challenge for SB 158. And, and the purpose of one, SB 158 was to not leave any child behind. And I, you know, I struggle a lot when we think about how we're the best managed state in, in the nation, but we still fail to, um, to cover, to bring adequate coverage for our children. We are 46 in the nation when it comes to healthcare coverage for children. 46 out of 50, it's a pretty embarrassing number. And unfortunately we're 50 out of 50 when it comes to Latinx kiddos. So we're failing our children. And I call that failure a big problem in our state policy and in state government. We should all be embarrassed that our state of Utah ranks so low when it comes to covering kids. If the pandemic didn't show us how critical it is to have healthcare coverage, especially when social determinants of health are determining the outcomes of the life of many of these kids, then I'm not, I, I don't know what else to, to say. I think it's pretty obvious that by not having access to quality care, our kids are not gonna succeed. So the, the purpose of SB 158 was removing multiple barriers that are reality for many of these kids. And the most costly out of all the barriers is really the opportunity for all children under 200% to apply, regardless of immigration status and other uh, components that make it really difficult for the most needy kids to actually access care. So I'm hoping, you know, I'm not letting it go. I will bring it back next year. I have a new strategy. I think um, the, resonating this information, it was difficult because as we were saying, oh, we have all this $400 million extra. We don't know what to do with them. Um, you were saying, but we don't have enough money, $5 million to cover kids. That message certainly brings tons of dissonance and it's not, I think, the message that the state of Utah wants to continue to push. So that was one very important piece. The other one that I will mention just really quick is our mental health, my mental health bill and the telehealth parity between mental health and physical health. Of course, pandemic um, with, with COVID-19, um, you know, this type of, you know, inter interjections and interventions were happening, which is via Zoom, right? We, a lot of the medical care was taking place via telehealth and we know it works. It's not for everyone. It is not for every medical condition, clearly, but mental health, uh, we've seen a dramatic increase on mental health, actually a crisis in our state and not being able to access providers was a problem. So what we brought is we brought the the telehealth component and the parity so people can access mental health through telehealth. And that was certainly an uphill battle to get all the insurance carriers to agree. Uh, believe it or not, there's still some disagreement on whether you pay a full visit like you will pay a physical visit through a telehealth visit. So that was, I think, a very important bill. It's already in effect. That actually was, it, it took effect as soon as the governor signed that bill. So now people can access uh, mental health services through telehealth and that provider will get reimbursed like it will be in in-person visits. So my number one priority was increasing access to mental health, which continues to be a big crisis. And of course, um, for women, when there is an increase on mental health um, needs, it also translates to unfortunately more domestic violence and assault and violence against women So in families. So we to me, it had that direct correlation beyond just the mental health of the person, but also what it means for the surroundings and the quality of life of many women and children in the state of Utah. Yeah, that's such a strong point that it does impact the, um, the incidence of domestic violence and sexual assault. This past legislative session, there were a handful of bills that addressed sexual assault and you sponsored several of them. Can you talk about some of those and what gaps do you still see in our state's response to sexual assault prevention? So I'll first start with um, a bill that unfortunately didn't pass and I, I, was, I was shocked and that's uh, HB 168, which is my, you know, my hermana in, in, in the fight, um, Representative Romero's bill on cell, um, cell of sexual assault test kits um, and the provision of that piece. And I, I was a Senate sponsor and it passed unanimously in the house and, and we do have those phenomena, right? And I think Representative Snow will talk about another one that unfortunately didn't pass in his bill. So I'll uh, um, let him explain more about that, which we will work back on that bill. But this specific bill on 
on the sexual assault kids. I mean, I mean, there's nothing more disturbing than the idea that you can that you can provide this sexual assault kits and have no process to use them in the in the courts and for the purpose of potentially a prosecution of a case. And you're giving this false hope to these survivors and victims of sexual assault and rape. And I, I was heartbroken to hear just the excuses behind it. And um, you know, I revictimization is real. And in this case, we now created, unfortunately, by not stopping the sale of this type of, um, you know, these kids, uh, created a, a systemic revictimization re of, of survivors. And I'm I'm in horror. I mean, it was heartbreaking. It was really sad. And and there was an interesting component of child abuse that was brought to the conversation. So when we talk about this intersectionality between um, also race and and um, and survivors of, of rape and assault for children, we see the same, right? I mean, here you have uh, an extra opportunity for perpetrators to engage on on activity like this on children on the name of, well, it's a home kid, I can do it at home and, and potentially create more victims um, of this type of, of horrific acts. So I, it's unfortunately, I know Representative Romero was very committed to, to bring this and I'm sure she'll continue to work. We've had multiple conversations after this, but that was unfortunate. I mean, I, I have to say for me, this year was an, an, an odd year where we thought we were moving forward on some of these pieces and the Senate came and the Senate, unfortunately, you know, I hate to say this, but that's my chamber, uh, killed some of these bills. And it was very unfortunate. It happened at committee, um, not on the floor, but at committee, which was even more devastating. Usually committee tends to deep more, you know, into the issue and do more analysis, more conversation. And in this case, both this bill and I know Representative Snow will talk about his bill on, on domestic violence didn't go through. So I will bring them back, but that's some of them. The other one is obviously a, a really one, a positive one was representative, um, you know, I work with Representative Daily Provo in her bill to bring um, access to contraceptives for women in, in, in jails. And that was another interesting process to to make sure the bill passed and we got the adequate, you know, the funding. It's a one-time funding, so we'll test it almost like a pilot program. And we saw a lot of those one times because of the um, the imbalance that I was talking about, our, our structural imbalance with the funding that the federal government brought. And we will have more of those funds. So, Gabrielle, maybe just to and I, I would like just to remind everyone, we're going to see a you know pattern on on the funds that will be coming our way. And you know we will be looking into securing funding, obviously, on issues related to um, domestic violence, sexual assault, and rape services and programs that are proactively uh, helping survivors and and victims. So I, you know, more to come. But the tricky part is that one-time component, right? So it brings us a little bit of a challenge as we continue to bring resources. But keep in mind, a lot of money will be coming in, and I, I want to make sure that funds adequately are serving our social services area. Education did really well this year and that's great, but we, we can think that our kiddos are gonna succeed in education when they don't have adequate access to healthcare. I mean, the social determinants of health are real and definitely determine sometimes, many instances, unfortunately, the outcome of the life of many of these kids and their families. Absolutely, and I just really appreciate your work in recognizing the intersectionality of all of those issues. And final question for you. If you could describe this past legislative session in one word, what would it be? Sorry, so I will say the word odd, I was saying, and uh, this has been the most odd legislative session for me and I've been there for 13 sessions. So I am um, very different and for people that were experiencing for the first time, they have nothing to compare, but it was definitely odd. The access to the legislature was different. I will say that being able to see people online and hundreds of people interacting in community hearings was actually really good. And I think we'll, we'll have that to stay because we really enjoyed the ability to have people anywhere in the state of Utah didn't have to drive and park and for them to be able to to interact for 30 seconds on a committee hearing or a minute, which you know, unfortunately, time is limited. But yeah, I, I think it was odd in so many levels, and 
And I'm looking forward to going back to a little bit more of our norm because I do miss the public and that interaction in person. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you being with us today and we will be in touch. Thank you, Gabrielle. Have a wonderful day. Our next panelist is Representative V. Lowry Snow. Representative Snow has lived in Southern Utah for over 40 years. He obtained his undergraduate degree from Brigham Young University and his Juris Doctorate from Gonzaga University. He founded his law firm Snow Jensen in recent 1979. And in 2012, he was elected as state representative for District 74. He serves as House Speaker Pro Tem and as chair of the House Education Standing Committee. Thank you so much for being with us, Representative Snow. I really appreciate the time you took. And thank you uh, for the invitation, uh, Gabriel. It means a lot to me to be a part of this. I've been able to participate uh, a couple of times previously, and, and this is a wonderful organization, and it was an honor to be invited. Yes, and I want to share with everybody that last year you were our public official of the year, and you really have done a lot to advance um, to advance work that benefits women and girls throughout the state. So thank you so much. Thank My you. first question to you is on domestic violence. Issues like domestic violence and sexual assault impact all communities and require a coordinated community response. You've often collaborated with colleagues outside of your party on domestic violence bills, such as HB 129 that was co-sponsored by Senator Escamilla and SB 163 sponsored by Senator Iwamoto. Will you talk about the importance of working across party lines to create policies that increase the health and safety of women and girls? Thank you. Uh, in my mind, I want to believe, and I, uh, and I think others uh, do too, that um, safety uh, for women and girls is not, and it should not be a partisan issue. Uh, it should be a collaborative issue. It is, it's something that I think um, all citizens should have a buy-in and have an interest in. Uh, let me just say though about um, the individuals I get to work with in the legislature on the other side of the aisle. Uh, I just have a great deal of respect for them and um, I consider it uh, a wonderful thing when I can run legislation uh, with them. This, this session working with uh, Senator uh, Escamilla and uh, Senator Iamoto on significant legislation uh, uh, to be um, connected with them in moving get policy forward is, is a great thing. I also think that it's important uh, when I'm running those kinds of bills, when possible, I recognize the value of having uh, um, a woman's perspective and a woman's voice and, and uh, uh, input in, in that process is, is really valuable. I, I want to be able to uh, communicate to the state that this wasn't just important um, for me for some reason, um, but that there are women and women of the, uh, of the other party who feel strongly about it. And so I, I, I was honored. Uh, Senator Escamilla touched a little bit upon um, my House Bill uh, 129 that didn't pass. And, and that one caught me really off guard. Uh, what I mean by that is I, I think it had a wide acceptance in the House, it moved over to the Senate and uh, got stopped in a Senate committee. Um, it was a bill to uh, create a coordinated effort and under the Office of uh, Domestic Violence and, uh, um, excuse me, Domestic Abuse and Sexual Violence. It's an office that already exists under CCJJ, but what this bill would have done was provided much more structure in terms of who should be on uh, that committee uh, the value of what they bring and, and, and taking a coordinated effort in helping address domestic violence and sexual violence, uh, primarily uh, hurting and, and victimizing women. Um, but I just wanna do, give a shout out to S Senator Escamilla who was on that Senate committee uh, where it ultimately failed. And again, I can't, I don't wanna get into uh, how or why that happened, but I wanna give a recognition to Senator Iscamia. She uh, made a, uh, 
a speech in that committee when she could see where this was going. And, and it was hard for me because it was some of my own party colleagues who were not supportive, uh, but she was absolutely incredible in, in her uh, defense of uh, the bill, but also uh, in her um, making absolutely clear why this was important and why uh, in Utah at this time, we needed a coordinated effort in, uh, in addressing this issue. So uh, Senator Escamilla, uh, I've never forgotten that and never will forget. Uh, so use that as an example, uh, Gabriela, as why it's important that we form alliances uh, across party lines on issues that are, um, that are fundamentally important to the safety of our citizens and fundamentally important to the safety of our women and children and, and girls in this state. Thank you. Um, Can I make one other comment briefly? Absolutely. Um, I, uh, Senator Iamoto asked me to carry uh, on, this, on the House side, her bill dealing with the safety of our young people on campuses. This is not the first time she's called on me to carry uh, a bill on campus safety. She has been the leader in our state on uh, and forging policy to protect our young people that, uh, that attend our um, state-sponsored colleges and university. And I don't know that she always gets enough credit for that, uh, but she has been uh, instrumental. And, and uh, when she calls on me to run it in the house, uh, I've always felt uh, honored and privileged. I oftentimes uh, I think of my own granddaughters now, I'm old enough, about them going away uh, to school. And I've got one attending uh, 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 SUU, for example. Uh, I think about their safety and their welfare. And uh, so uh, it's been a real honor to work with Senator Iamoto to, to, help, um, to help promote that. And frankly, it's an issue that we haven't given a lot of thought to. And, and unfortunately, it took a really tragic incident to help us refocus our energy and uh, because of Senator Iamoto's leadership in that area, I think we've made great strides. Your bill HB 255 makes modifications to protective orders, including requiring an expiration date on the civil protective order form. And it also adds sexual battery as a qualifying offense for protective orders. Why were those changes important to make? Well, uh, they were important. Um, and let me back up a little more background. I ran 255 because in the previous uh, session, I uh, ran a comprehensive um, alignment of all of our protective uh, orders and bringing some uniformity, uh, much needed uniformity to the process of how those are obtained by uh, victims. Um, but in so doing, there were a few uh, uh, issues that we didn't address that should have been. And so one of them, or two of them were the ones that, that you've mentioned. Uh, we didn't address the issue of putting a, um, a, uh, um, an outside date on our civil protective orders and, and we should have included sexual battery. Sexual battery is something that uh, is a real uh, issue with some of our uh, um, younger women, although it can be older women too, but we have even some minor uh, girls that, um, um, young men haven't realized that, that uh, some things are off limits uh, and and we need to offer protection for them as well as the uh, as uh, adult women as well sexual battery is looked at as more of a minor offense and i don't want to uh, to devalue the importance of having that but it was important that uh, that that be included as an offense that uh, that uh, someone could obtain that protection and keep them from, from being harassed. Uh, another protection that we left out or didn't realize we created a loophole that we closed with uh, House Bill 255 was uh, there was a, a provision uh, in the uh, bill that I ran last year that had, a, um, had uh, protections for uh, for when, when a, a, report, a, a court order was issued, if there was a violation and, and the offender was rearrested, uh, there was a remedy. But uh, in some cases, there's not a rearrest, there's an issuance of a citation. 
And uh, some perpetrators were getting around that by saying, well, I wasn't rearrested. I was only given a citation. We closed that loophole, but that's one example uh, that was important that we address to make sure that as much as possible, uh, we provide the protections that we uh, intended to with that legislation. Thank you so much for your work in that area. Now for the final question, if you could describe this past legislative session in one word, what would it be? Uh, I hate to take um, uh, a page maybe out of uh, Senator uh, Escamilla's, uh, she used the word odd, I'm going to use the word abnormal. Uh, and, and, and we think of that word in, usually in, in negative, uh, as a negative connotation. Um, but it really means uh, outside of the norm, and, and it was. I'll tell you what I missed was the interaction uh, of, of the people like those of you who are joining this, uh, who come up to the Capitol, who ask us to step off the floor and weigh in on legislation. Uh, I, I really miss the energy uh, of, of uh, that, at that uh, attention, so to speak, by people who engage in the process. Uh, but on the other hand, I think our level of participation of those who joined via Zoom, via camera, was amazing. Uh, we had committee meetings where we had people well over 100 attend, uh, and, and they didn't always ask to participate, but they were listening, they were watching, and, uh, and so uh, that's kind of... Uh, a mixed bag, uh, but it was certainly abnormal in terms of what we were used to. And I look forward to uh, getting back to uh, maybe a more normal, but I also hope that we as a legislature look at some of the value of some of these tools and, and maybe continue them. Uh, I don't see any reason why we couldn't uh, offer both going into uh, the next session. That is uh, people live coming to a committee, but also maintaining um, cameras so that the uh, folks outside of the Capitol can participate as well. I hope that answers your question, Gabriella. Yes, it does. And thank you so much for participating with us today. Have a wonderful day, Representative Snow. Thank you very much. The next section of our panel covers the policy area of racial justice and civil rights for women and girls of color. Our priority areas include education and juvenile justice, immigration, and missing and murdered indig indigenous women and girls in Two-Spirit. Our first panelist in this section is Senator Jani Iwamoto. Senator Iwamoto was elected to the Utah State Senate to represent District 4 in 2014. She serves in Senate leadership as Assistant Minority Caucus Whip. She previously served on the Salt Lake County Council where she became the first Asian American woman elected in the state of Utah. She graduated magna cum laude in mass communications from the University of Utah and went on to receive a JD from UC Davis School of Law, where she practiced as a partner in a prominent California law firm. She serves on several legislative committees, including the Native American Legislative Liaison Committee, which seeks to address concerns affecting Native American tribes. She's passionate about criminal and social justice issues, campus safety, and environment, environmental quality. Thank you so much for joining us today, Senator Iwamoto. And my first question to you is, as a senator, you have focused a lot on addressing domestic violence. Your bill that Representative Snow mentioned, SB 163, Campus Safety Amendments, is one that crosses over two of our priority areas. Will you share how it seeks to protect students, faculty, and staff on college campuses? Yes, thank you. And I, I just want to thank you for having me. And also, I couldn't be more thrilled to be with uh, Senator Escamilla, uh, Representative Snow, and I see others too, um, and Representative Hollins and others, and thank you for having me and for the work that you do. And um, I just want to say, yes, I started uh, previously, I wanted to, uh, the first bill was uh, two or three years ago, uh, Campus Safety Amendments, um, Senate Bill 134, and again, I worked with Representative Snow, who's whose uh, passion and understanding. And we've gone through the ringer on these bills. They haven't been easy. <laughs> and this year was uh, really crazy on, on the bill and what others thought it was doing. But uh, that was to do camp campus safety plans. And then Senate Bill 80, which is still in effect in a way because we're, we come out with a report in November on law enforcement issues that we found when we were doing that first bill, whether 
you know, we want to make sure there's seamless boundaries boundaries for um, students and others that um, need help, that there's no boundaries from on and off campus. This bill, Senate Bill 163, um, what passed in this bill and what didn't, we had a statewide commission for students and I really wanted this bill for them because it would be a step away from the institution and the first ever uh, commission. Um, that was stripped from the bill because they felt it was some kind of, I don't know what they thought, but it, uh, we will re-envision that and that will happen because it was something that gave the students hope that I have a say in the policies that impact their lives. But the part that was really important of the bill that we kept is the part about reporting. There are uh, buildings that are off campus that sometimes have been used for uh, unspeakable crimes against women. And that's what led to this, um, this legislation. So what we found was we, um, although the Clary uh, Act uh, made for, you know, gathering certain information, it's never reported and it wasn't uh, aggregated by the different um, buildings that are off campus, they're owned and maybe leased and uh, to for students to live in. There are some who are very far off campus. So what this bill did was to make sure that we get the crime disaggregated at each of those buildings, whether it's the fraternity or another building that's off campus or, and we extended it and made it to include like the parking lots and everything that, and so hopefully with that, when our students and parents come to school, they will know um, and be able to make a good decision on where they want to live and it will be open. And I think that's really important for the students. And they, we had hundreds of students supporting it and it was a really great bill and working with uh, Representative Snow. Two bills that came from that too, um, from my campus safety work was uh, two police reform bills. And it was when uh, it was uh, Senate Bill 13 and 196 and they were companion bills and dealt with when an officer resigns or leaves that we make sure that whether it's a post violation or a interagency violation that those violations are that that inv investigations will be uh, completed. And so that was sort of spawned by the officer Garris situation where he allegedly left and then uh, they had not completed investigation. And um, 196 was just part of that bill where we make sure if there's a fine line, but we wanted to make sure that uh, officers could feel, have some protection in coming forward to talk about bad cops. And, and it was a consensus bill with stakeholders from community groups, Black Lives Matter, NAACP um, with all the law enforcement agencies and cities and towns and the law enforcement said, we want uh, also want transparency and accountability because we can take people's property and their lives and we want to be held accountable for public trust. And then the other is the domestic violence bill for increasing and enhancing the penalty when there's multiple uh, domestic violence. Thank you so much for championing the work in those areas. Last week, you joined other leaders and elected officials from Utah's Asian American and Pacific Islander community in a statement denouncing anti-Asian hate and violence in response to the shootings in Atlanta, Georgia. Harassment and hate and violence have far-reaching effects on the person being targeted as well as the community. Eradicating hate from our minds and speech is one step towards eliminating racism, but we also need to examine the ways that our behaviors and collective culture dehumanizes marginalized folks. Will you talk about what propelled you to sponsor SB 10 place name amendments and discuss the important role it plays in addressing racism towards indigenous communities? So I've done a lot of bills with the Native American community and this one was one of their priorities this year. I've been working on it for the last couple of years and an Ed Naranjo with the uh, Goshu tribes had, had um, come to me and said, how do we do this? How do we change the term squaw? It's a, and the squaw, as many know, is in the tribes in Utah. No, not one of them. It's an offensive word. It's, um, uh, it's basically uh, synonymous with uh, prostitute and violence against women. And, and we know that the numbers are so high in, with, for the women in that community. And so I worked for a couple of years working with all the tribes and our naming commissions and the federal. And, and so uh, 
we found that it was such a complicated uh, effort to change a geographical location name and the process that you have to go to. So we involved the um, Division of Indian Affairs who would put together sort of a template and application process. And in the bill, I wanted to make sure too that the um, Native American in that tribes that are in that location will have a seat at the table. That was very important for this legislation. And it really does collide with what's happening with the Asian American Pacific Islander community now. We just had a big press conference at the Salt Lake County and I spoke with that. And, in, and with the killings in Georgia, um, you know, it's a, it's a scary tr uh, trend that's happening nationally. We don't have as many reports here and I don't know how we report it or not, but there have been almost 4,000 hate reports against Asians across um, the US from racism and xenophobia. And, and like uh, Senator Iskamia said, uh, the intersectional part, 68% um, of these women were women uh, and minorities uh, in Georgia. And this is called, has that intersectional dynamic where Asian women are seen as easy targets. And this is an example when uh, sexism and racism coalesce. And so it's a very, um, it, it's very heart-wrenching everything that's happening. And I lived in the Bay Area for um, a long time and I saw this happen before when uh, the auto industry was suffering and they blamed it on Japan and, and the killing of Vincent Chin was related to that. And, um, and so those things are very, uh, you know, heart-wrenching and close to my heart that have changed me as a person. So those are some of the reasons why, you know, and this one with the Native American community, because they also experienced that too. Well, I really appreciate you just being a voice and being willing to have these discussions in our community and, and being a leader in that area. Now for the final question, if you could describe the past legislative session in one word, what would it be? Okay. Well, there's, I've got many words, but I'll tell I think I would say surreal because um, it was surreal with what's happening with the pandemic. It's been surreal with all the other things that have been happening in our country and in our state with, you know, riots and earthquakes and fires and shootings. And um, so I would say surreal and I would, really echo what the others have said because um, I am looking forward to going to the Capitol and being able to, that personal connection with people is really important. And sometimes I felt like since we, well, some of us, I wasn't, but um, I just felt more of a division in some respects, even though we all work together because um, it just seemed a little in some ways divisive, but, it, and. But then in some ways, I loved how the public was able, like on my campus safety bill, although they couldn't get in to speak, they said they, were, they couldn't get into the, they weren't allowed in, but hundreds of people were participating from all over the state, which I think is really, really, really important. So I agree. I think there, I've talked to leadership, they were saying that they would, um, prob they would be keeping a lot of this so that we could have full engagement because there was hardly a time when someone wasn't present. And when you're regularly there'd be people that you know weren't present and so I think the public involvement was good but there's nothing to replace being with with each other thank you so much for your insight and for your time with us today Senator Iwamoto have a wonderful day and I just want to check in. We are a little bit behind schedule. We still have three more panelists to go. So if you can stay with us beyond the one o'clock mark, we would love to. Um, we would love to have you with us. Our next panelist is Representative Sandra Hollins. Representative Hollins was elected in 2014 as a state representative serving District 23. She earned a Bachelor's of Science in Business Management from the University of Phoenix and an MSW from the University of Utah. She currently serves on several committees in the legislature, and she's also served on the Child Welfare Legislative Oversight Panel, Fair Park Community Council, Greater Salt Lake Alumni Chapter, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, National Black Caucus of State Legislators, and the NAACP. Welcome, Representative Hollins. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me. 
My first question to you is about your bill HB 345 school resource officer amendments that seeks to add content to and broaden the intended audience of SRO training. What do we need to get right regarding SRO training to ensure that students of color do not continue to be disproportionately impacted by the school to prison pipeline? Yes, thank you. And thank you all for YWCA for your willingness to have these conversations. Um, um, I know that these issues around racism and, and other isms in the community is not an easy conversation. So I want to commend you all for your willingness to, to step out and, and um, have these difficult conversations. So um, my bill around the school, um, S, um, this um, SROs, um, you know, I started this several years ago. Um, I've always had an interest in how do we keep our young people um, out of um, juvenile justice system, out of the criminal justice system. Um, it's, it's quite interesting because this morning, just this morning, I was reading a story um, in the news about a six-year-old in North Carolina that was arrested for standing at the bus stop and picking flowers um, this morning. And he had to go up, actually appear in court. And because of his attention span, his lawyer had to give him coloring books so he can pick, so he can stay focused on 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 what was going on um and so it's just incidents like that that just breaks my heart and makes me want to work harder to keep our kids um out of the criminal justice system especially when they are just being kids their kid this is kid behavior um so several years ago i sponsored hb 470 um, and what that did was it asked our sros to have training around um um, cult, how do you work with kids from different cultural background and with mental health issues um, in the school system? Because we know that um, unfortunately our kids of color are the ones, particularly our Native American kids, are disproportionately funneled into that criminal, um, the school of prison pipeline. And so I sponsored that bill. So this year, um, I went back and said, okay, we've done this. We've seen that there are some good results that are happening. Let's do this. Let's, instead of saying may, let's say shall. You shall have this training because there was some confusions about this training um, and, who, and whether they should, who should take this training. But there was also some confusion around what should be in the MOU. Um, SB 470 required, um, 460 required that um, there be an MOU between law enforcement and the school system. And so this bill better outlined that and also looked at data collection and um, setting up some steps before a child is arrest, uh, arrested or suspended, we want to know what has been set in place. Um, unfortunately, um, the bill made it um, out of committee. It made it, you know, with some changes that not only did the school system ask me to make, but law enforcement, I was able to work with both of them and, and address their concerns. Made it out of the House, but when it went to the Senate, it was gutted. Uh, the, the bulk of this bill and what it does and the bite in this bill was taken out. They removed they removed a lot of it. And so um, that's the bill that we have. Um, I'm looking forward this summer to continuing this conversation. This is this is not a defeat. Um, it's just a re now um, go, stepping back and then going at it again and seeing what we what we're going to do to continue to protect our children. Absolutely. The pandemic, like other crises in the past, exposed, exposed the disparate impact on racial and ethnic minorities. House Joint Resolution 13, declaring racism a moral and public health crisis, is really a powerful statement recognizing the intersection between racism and public health. Mm -hmm. It reads in part, and I recommend everybody go and read the entire declaration, but in one small section says, whereas there is clear data that racism negatively impacts the lives of people of color in Utah, and in the United States, including through its effect on social determinants of health. Representative Hollins, what are some examples of how racism impacts social determinants of health and what additional steps can be made on a state level to address racism? Yes, thank you. Um, you know, one of the things I can say is that COVID-19, excuse me, COVID-19 exposed a lot in, in, in our communities around health determinants. Um, when we looked at the data to see who was being exposed, um, who was being hospitalized, who was getting sick, 
it was a majority was the communities of color. It was our Latino communities. It was our Native American community. It was our Pacific Islanders um, and our black community who was being impacted by COVID-19 at, at the greatest rate. And we know all of this, a lot of it is because of the underlying health issues that our communities deal with. And our communities deal with it because of lack of access to um, health care. Um, when we start looking at housing um, um, in our communities, our families and our communities are more likely to live together so they can't isolate. They can't, there is no isolating in, in, in our communities. So we were being impacted at a greater rate. And when you look at the reason why, it, a lot of it is because of racism and because of lack of access in our communities. And so that was one of my main reasons for running this piece of legislation because I wanted to bring awareness that we do have these issues in our community. What do we need to be doing in order for, so if another pandemic hit that we won't be disproportionately impacted as we were um, during COVID, during COVID-19. Um, I think there still needs to be a lot of conversation around what needs to happen. We need to look at um, access um, to healthcare in our community, who has access to insurance. You know, when we start looking at, um, at our medical facilities and, and our doctors, you know, I could tell you in the Black community, um, there is a lack of trust in the medical care system because historically of what has been done in the Black community. And so as a result, we don't want to take the vaccine and we don't want to go to, to, the, to the doctors and see the doctors because we feel that they don't understand us. Um, it was brought to my attention, you know, one of my colleagues up at the Capitol who was a doctor brought to my attention um, some of the testing that's done in the healthcare system and how it's, um, it's, it's, it discriminates in particularly against the Black community. And it, it just blew me away when he was started talking about what was happening. So these are issues that we've got to address in our community and racism. We've got to have that conversation. And so the bill didn't pass, but a remarkable thing happened. It was I circled the bill, but a remarkable thing happened. We were having conversations at that level. We were having conversation at the Capitol around racism and what racism is because the way I see racism as a black woman may be different than say someone, a white man who lives in rural Utah see racism. My experience is different from his experience. You know, uh, racism for me is not just calling me um, a derogatory name. Sometimes it's in the way I receive care in the community. Sometimes it's me going into a restaurant and being denied service. You know, sometimes it's just little things that you know, other people can, can't see, but I can recognize and I and I see what's happening and other people of color know knows what's happening. You know, I had someone tell me last year, a woman that I know in the community told me she was denied service in a restaurant, actually denied service. And so this is happening in our community. We need to have a conversation about it. And I'm so happy that this bill did what I wanted to do, it to do. It started a conversation. Yes, absolutely. And it's, I, and I just really admire your willingness to continue having the conversation. We'll be right there with you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> For the final question, if you could describe the 2021 legislative session in one word, what would it be? Wow, you know what? I'm going to agree with my colleagues that was on here before all of those words, but I want to add, it was weird. <laughs> it was a weird session. Um, with COVID-19 and us having to go in and get tested and, and, and um, our interns were being tested and, and not having the public there physically. You know, I have to say, I miss all of the young people because we had a number of schools that would come up and interact with us and seeing these young people, you know, wide-eyed and, and, and just intrigued by what is happening, you know, and having that conversation with them around the political process and hearing their ideas and their goals, um, for me was, was um, is what I miss the most about this session. Um, the good thing, as my other colleague said, is the fact that more, I think more people were able to engage via, you know, internet um, and logging in and hearing 
um, what was happening. And so I, I like that. And I'm hoping as a representative um, Snow said that that's one portion that we are able to keep once everything is back to, to normal, that we are able to keep that. Well, thank you so much for your time and for your leadership. Oh, thank you. You all take care. Thank you, you too. Bye. Our next section, this is our final section, it covers the policy area empowerment and economic advancement for women and girls, which includes affordable housing, child care and early education and women's employment. The legislature covered many affordable housing bills and approved $50 million towards affordable housing efforts. And there are going to be some federal funds coming our way through the um, American Rescue Plan Act. There were very few bills that dealt with child care and women's employment. Um, our first panelist is Representative Marsha Judkins, who was elected to the State House in 2018, representing District 61, which covers Provo and Southwest Orem. She grew up in Northern California, but has lived in Provo for almost four decades and has been very active in her community. She was elected in 2012 to serve on the Provo School Board, where she came to realize that the state legislature has most of the power over education. In her real life, she's the mother of seven kids, 13 grandchildren, and she was a stay-at-home mom until 11 years ago when she started working as a children's librarian. She currently serves as an adjunct professor of developmental math at Utah Valley University. She has a bachelor's degree in political science and a master's degree in public administration from BYU. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today, Representative Judkins. And my first question for you is, Utah is experiencing affordable housing crisis that is disproportionately affecting members of marginalized communities. According to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, the cost of rent in Utah has risen 18% over the last 18% over the last 20 years, while renters' median income has only risen by 9%. Many people pay over half their income in rent. And sometimes, as you discovered, there are hidden expenses when somebody goes to sign a contract. So tell us about your bill, HB 68, Rental Expenses Disclosure Requirements, and how it seeks to improve housing stability in Utah. Thank you so much. Yes. So. Um... Housing stability is essential, as we know, for the healthy development of families and children, and it helps establish relationships and cultivate community and to support education. And when we have, um, when our housing market is so limited as it is right now, like you said, it does really affect mostly our marginalized communities. And so we also have another problem in that Utah has, uh, has renter laws that do not protect the renter hardly ever. They're, they're very unbalanced towards the landlord. And maybe landlords would disagree with that, but, um, but in the fall of 2020, a team of students at the, at the um, law school at the University of Utah conducted a study. And what they found is that Utah needs to have pragmatic, fair and regulatory framework that requires all Utah leases to be transparent, understandable, and actionable for landlords and renters before we can even start on the larger problem of all the evictions and things that we have. So my bill is a tiny part of this, um, and it seems like it should be a no-brainer, but what it does is it requires landlords to disclose all the fees, monthly fees, that a renter is going to have to pay before the renter gives any money to the landlord. And there, and Land, good landlords already do this, but we do have predatory landlords, quite a few actually, um, who um, will, will advertise one price and a renter will give an application fee and offer a, a deposit or other fees to that landlord to hold that space because we're so limited in our housing market right now. And then when they go to sign the lease, they find that there are um, often a lot of fees that have not been included in that advertised price. And um, at that point, they can either choose to sign the lease and try to juggle their budget so that they can pay this, these increased housing costs monthly, or they can walk away from the lease, but then they've lost their application fee and any other fees that they've put into this. And so my bill says that if a, a renter gets to that point where they're going to sign a lease and there's been hidden fees that are suddenly disclosed, then the if the renter decides not to sign that lease, then they would get those monies back. 
that the landlord would be, be required to get those landlord, those monies back. And it's, it's not, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited that it passed, but it's not as great as it sounds because I, in order to get it passed, I had to take out all the teeth in the bill. So it's mostly, um, it's in the premises act. It's mostly an educational, educational bill, best practices bill that um, I'm going to continue working on and trying to get some consumer protections in there. Wonderful. The Federal American Rescue Plan Act will provide Utahns with rental assistance that is de desperately needed now. As a policymaker, what policy should we consider for the long term to make Utah a more affordable place to live? Such a good question. And it's, you know, it's tricky because when the state does enacts policy, it goes through the entire state and um, and there's often unintended consequences that follow. So, but one of the big things that have come out from every study and everything that I've looked at is that we do need to um, have more protections for renters. We have triple damages when they're evicted. They're, they're, and, and evictions, once a renter is evicted, it's so hard to get back into the, you know, and, and be able to rent again. And, and so we're squeezing these renters from all sides. And so we need to really look at um, bit by bit passing laws that will even the playing field between landlords and renters. And there are other things that that um, the state can do. You know, you mentioned that we put $50 million into affordable housing. We're leveraging that with our philanthropic partners to $750 million. And, and so there are things that we can do. It's just really hard sometimes when, um, when landlords maybe see it as an attack on them, but it's not an attack on them because, because stable renters benefit landlords and the renter. It's a very expensive process for a landlord to evict a tenant also. So if we can just balance this out and get, get these protections in there, it would be, I think that that would do a good job. Plus, I wanna mention all of these other bills that, that have been talked about today and will be talked about they really help to stabilize families and, um, and upward mobility, having economic development, taking away bias that um, is implicit in our system and increasing opportunities for all really will help us to get more stable um, housing situations for our families. Yes, they really are all interconnected. Thank you for your insights on that very complex issue that is affordable housing. For my final question to you, what is the one word you would use to describe this? Because I do feel like it was a really productive session. I mean, you saw a lot of good bills passed. We saw a lot of good bills not passed, but I was really happy with the ones that did. But then I was thinking quiet. I would just say quiet. It was... I'm a noisy person. I'm a talker. So it was, that was a hard thing for me. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. And I really appreciate all the work that you're doing. Thank you, Gabriella. Our next and final panelist is Representative Ashley Matthews, who was elected in 2020 to represent District 38, where she serves um, in the legislature. She serves on the Business, Economic Development, and Labor Appropriation. Committee and the business is a married mother of two who has worked at Utah Department of Transportation for 10 years. Representative Matthews was raised in a West Side working class family and knows the meaning of hard work. She serves as a board member for the single parent project, is a mentor at Big Utah, and foster volunteer with Animal Rescues. Thank you so much for being with us, Representative Matthews. You bet. Thanks for having me. My first question to you is. In your first year as a representative, you accomplished a real major feat with HB 277, child care eligibility amendments. Talk about what this bill does and how it will impact Utah families. Sure. I, I have to tell you, I am so happy to talk about this bill because this is this is my pride and joy. I know it's so stupid, but I I just feel like a like a proud mama hen, you know. So um, this this is something that we we knew was important and that we knew we wanted to focus on anyway. And then 
COVID happened and it kind of, um, I guess, accelerated the, the need for it. Um, so what this does is it, it just expands um, the eligibility requirements for people who, uh, for families who are, uh, need childcare subsidies. So um, to me, <laughs> I, I kind of just don't know why we haven't been doing it this way the whole time and, and hopefully, you know, getting, getting the processes in place will we'll be able to, to continue um, serving families at, at this level and at these thresholds and moving forward. But what it does is, is it uh, makes it so that the Utah thresholds are, are expanded to meet the federal thresholds so that families that now, now families that make up to 85% of the state median income will qualify for these subsidies. Um, it is uh, awarded on a Kind of a sliding scale that that models the the military child care subsidies. So, you know, the obviously the poorer families receive a 100% uh, subsidy, and then just kind of as families make more and they kind of progress up the up the ladder, I guess, um, then they'll receive a a smaller benefit. But it's still going to offset those costs and kind of give a little bit more breathing room. Um, the the uh, shutdowns and everything that happened with COVID kind of happened overnight and kind of feel like a, a lot of families like mine, you know, just regular working class people just kind of had the rug pulled out from underneath them. And, and so it kind of, it kind of put us in, into a shock sort of. So um, obviously recovering from that is going to be a lot more drawn out than, than, <laughs> than how quickly it, it, it came about. So um I was, I'm happy that, that the body was able to, to pass this so that we can help families because it's obviously the, the lower income families that are going to be the ones that struggle the most to try to, to get back to, to normal. So this is just one of the, one of the things that we were able to do to, to help that, to remove the barriers for families that are, um, that have either been completely unemployed or that are now underemployed and, kind of help, like I said, give that buffer, that breathing room so that they can get their feet back underneath them and, and you know, kind of rebuilding. So anyway. So you mentioned that some of the lower income families are going to have a harder time recovering. And like, you know, the cost of childcare and housing are unaffordable to so many working Utah families. You proposed HB 361 minimum wage modifications. Do you see raising the minimum wage as a way for families to be able to cover the cost of childcare and housing? I think it's definitely one of one of the things that that we have to do. My uh, my grandma used to tell me all the time that the, the only way you can eat an elephant is by doing it one bite at a time. And I know that there's there's been several uh, presenters that have kind of alluded to that same thing that there's families like mine and like in my district there there are a lot of issues <laughs> there are a lot of reasons why we we struggle and and uh so just kind of picking little bites off of off of all the things will eventually get us to to where we need to be and um you know the minimum wage is i think a very very big part of that um just because the the people who are making minimum wage are the most vulnerable people they're, they're the ones that um usually you know the single parents and people people like me who don't have college degrees we don't have you know education and things to fall back on so we we just got to take the jobs that we can get and um and you know and then once you get into these jobs and you rely on that money then it kind of you kind of work yourself into into a corner you know you have to work at least your 40 hours or overtime if it's available to you just so that you can keep up on your bills, which means you don't have time afterwards to, to take, you know, classes at the community college and go back and, and get a degree. And, and, you know, you can't really spend time looking for another job because all of your time is either working or picking up kids from school or helping with homework and, you know, grocery shopping, and all these sorts of things. So I think if we can, um, yeah, start start there and just kind of build off of that and and with 
with the child care subsidies and with raising minimum wage and with many of the other things that my colleagues were able to do this last year, I think all of these little things are going to add up and 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 help families in, in big ways. So. So with this being your very first legislative session, if you could describe it in one word, what would it be? I, <laughs> um, well, I mean, low hanging fruit, I would say it's new. It's all new, not just, obviously it's new to me, but, um, you know, there are people that have been in the legislature for, you know, 10, 20 years and, and they had to learn and, and adjust and try to figure out how to do how to do things this year. So for me, I, I was kind of grateful that um, that we were all on a level playing field that I knew just as much about what to expect as people that had been here forever. And um, and so, so I made it a little bit easier. I was also really glad that I got to uh, ask stupid questions and make, you know, the stupid rookie mistakes without having an audience because it was just, it was just in the building. So I didn't have to worry about <laughs> too many people noticing when I, when I did something stupid or when I got lost in the tunnels or when I walked into their own conference room. So that was really nice. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for being with us and for sharing your experiences and all of the great work that you're doing. You bet. Thank you for having us. I appreciate it. You bet. And Thank you to everyone who attended our 2021 legislative recap. We hope you enjoyed learning about our legislative priorities as highlighted by our panelists. Please join us at upcoming events, including our Stronger Together event and our Real Woman Run series. You can find out more about those on our website at ywcautah.org. And this concludes our event today. We have recorded it and we'll make it available within the next week on Facebook and YouTube. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.